Okay, let's Okay, let's get started, everyone. I think we've got people still coming in. I'm Michelle Hichelin. I'm the Executive Director of ActionAid Australia. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land uh, where I am. It's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, uh, including those on the call today. And please do acknowledge the lands you're joining us from uh, in the chat. Um, and, you know, if you want to introduce yourself, use the chat function. Uh, you'll also be able to use that to ask any questions of the speakers. Um, as mentioned, please do keep your microphone on mute uh, unless you are speaking, uh, unless you're one of the speakers, um, and just put uh, questions in the chat. But delighted to welcome you to Women Leading Climate Solutions. This is a new series being hosted by Women's Agenda and Action Aid Australia. There is absolutely no doubt that climate change is driving more extreme weather events around the world. Uh, we've definitely seen it in mid-northwest uh, coast of New South Wales with the severe flooding this year, uh, and in the Pacific where Vanuatu uh, has seen two destructive cyclones over the past week. Um, there is clear evidence that the climate crisis is also slowing progress on gender equality increasing violence against women and women's unpaid work. Yet far from being victims, women are at the forefront of the response and driving innovative climate solutions. And this series is about highlighting these efforts and lifting the visibility of diverse women leading climate action in Australia and overseas. For ActionAid as a global women's rights organisation working to advance climate justice for women in 45 countries around the world, it is vital that as Australians, we stand in solidarity with our sisters overseas who've done the least to cause the problem, but are experiencing the worst impacts. So through this series, we'll be spotlighting some of the inspiring partners we are working with overseas. Today, that was to be Rosette um, Kalmet, uh, who's leading nature-based solutions to climate change in Vanuatu. But due to the devastating cyclones that hit last week, um, she's been cut off from communications. Uh, and so ActionAid's country program manager, Flora Vano, has kindly agreed to step in for Rosette today. A big thank you, Flora. Uh, we know you're also dealing personally with the impacts of the cyclone, um, as well as leading a response effort. So we're, we're really thrilled to have you today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to our moderator today, uh, Angela Priestley, who's the founding editor of Women's Agenda and the executive director of its parent company, Agenda Media. Angela is also part of ActionAid's Rise Fund Leadership Circle, which is supporting women to prepare for and respond to the climate crisis. Thanks, Angela. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you uh, so much for having me. And hello from uh, Camaragal land, where I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of, and also to note the care for country from traditional owners for tens of thousands of years. I'm uh, thrilled to be moderating this session on women leading climate solutions and to highlight how women are at the forefront of the solution. I might say just up front that uh, we do have that chat going at the moment. If you would like to share where you are joining us from today, that would be excellent. And we'll also be opening it up for questions too. Um, we've kept, I mean, I've kept the questions to ask actually pretty limited at this point so that we can have that time for discussion. And so just love to see, like I say, what what, what you think of what's going on, where, you, where, you, where you're from, maybe what's going on in your background, things like that. Uh, so I run a news publication called Women's Agenda, and we publish a day we publish daily news stories on uh, politics, uh, business, leadership, tech, health, and entrepreneurship. And we really aim to highlight uh, a women's perspective and, and how uh, women are impacted by those news stories. A couple of years ago, we made the deliberate decision to make climate a key pillar of what we do. Because while we published uh, various stories about climate change in the past, uh, we wanted to really highlight how climate change actually impacts everything else concerning women, concerning equality and equity. And we wanted to really highlight the point that as a news organisation, every story is a climate story. And uh, given our own primary focus on uh, gender equality, uh, to highlight that Climate change will only hinder the progress made on women's economic opportunity, on uh, women's uh, security and safety and um, uh, financial uh, well-being later on as well. 
Uh, also that diverse leadership and representation matters if we're ever going to be able to tackle the biggest crisis of our time and and also to highlight how girls education and women's empowerment globally is really uh, one of the top solutions for dealing with climate change as well as the resistance and the resilience and uh, the tenacity of women in uh, muscling through to the front despite having very few seats at the table for far too long. Um, I want to note uh, that it has been a year since the Lismore floods here in Australia where thousands of homes were lost and many thousands more were damaged and um, I know that from our own research over the past week speaking to women there that this community is still really struggling and rebuilding. I want to note that it's been three years obviously since the bushfire crisis and that um, the climate crisis is very much here in Australia as it is in the Pacific and as it is all over the world and the need for solidarity has never been greater and the need for innovation has never been greater and thankfully we have some um, incredible uh, women leaders out there who are doing just that. So I will introduce our panel that we have to discuss all this today. Um, so to uh, to Flora, so Flora Vanu, who leads ActionAid's country office in Vanuatu and identifies as a feminist, humanitarian and climate change activist. Uh, the focus on ActionAid's climate, uh, sorry, the focus on ActionAid's uh, country office in Vanuatu is to support local women-led community-based protection, resilience and climate change adaption and resilience work, as well as responding to COVID-19. Um, so Flora was a finalist uh, of uh, sorry, a 2020 nominee of the Rising Star Global DRR Award. She's played a critical role in providing uh, leadership in a number of uh, startups across uh, Vanuatu that help women to organize and strategize. And she has extensive experience working in emergency response and advancing women's rights. Hello, Flora. And one thing I might say when we do get to questions is that you are very much dealing with the climate crisis as we speak right now. So we will be asking about some of that, but hello, Flora, thank you for joining us. And uh, introducing, introducing Blair Palice. Blair is a director of philanthropy at uh, Ethi Vest, Eth Invest, Australia's oldest impact investment advisor and managing editor of climate and capital media focused on the trends, investment opportunities and innovators of the emerging climate economy. She has worked in the climate and environment space in Australia, the US and internationally, and in 2009 founded 350.org Australia, where she was CEO for 10 years. She was also communications director for Greenpeace International, head of PR for The Body Shop, and I might just add in also a finalist on a Women's Agenda ah, a Climate you. Award last year. So thank you for joining us, Blair. Thank you. And also introducing uh, Tiani Adamson. Tiani is the lead community engagement officer for CH4 Global and part of a dynamic team that uh, research and fosters uh, sustainable seaweed aquaculture with a goal of zero methane agriculture. And I know that uh, you mentioned before that uh, you had your hands deep in seaweed <laughs> just possibly minutes ago or hours ago. So uh, very much real and very much happening right now. As a Torres Strait Islander woman descended from the uh, Karareg Nations on Thursday Island and a wildlife conservation biologist, Tiani works diligently on a variety of external projects to nurture country, find solutions to our climate crisis and advocate for First Nations justice and land rights. Tiani lectures at uni, um, the University of South Australia, embedding First Nations knowledges into STEM careers. She's an Uluru Statement from the Heart Youth Leader and is the state coordinator for SEED, a First Nations only run climate uh, youth activism group. Um, in 2019, Tiani was trained by Al Gore as a climate reality leader and has spoken to thousands of people at events all over the world and all over the country about the severity of our climate crisis. And Tiani uh, was recently awarded the University of Adelaide's Distinguished Alumni. So hello, Tiani. Thank you so much for joining us. So Flora, I will uh, go to you first. And once again, thank you for being able to get on this call. I know it hasn't been easy, um, but uh, you, you're dealing with a crisis right now uh, in terms of the preparation, in terms of the uh, response to the cyclone there. 
Can you, first of all, just give us an update on what the current situation is like? Is um, thank you, An thank you, Angela. Um, this week we were hit by two cyclones. We had Chudi, tropical cyclone Chudi, who came in and reached category four and left. And then uh, just a day in between Chudi, we had also tropical cyclone Kevin who came and left Port Villa uh, on a category four, but then when it hit the other islands down south of uh, Vanuatu, Tafea, it's a category five. So within one week and in a span of, let's say three to four days, two major cyclone came, came through. It's, and it's like you, it, the, the, it's history. We we've, haven't seen something like that. And I've, we've known that uh, we had tropical cyclone fam in 2015. And then in 2020, we had tropical cyclone Harold called a category five, and that give us some times to recover. But within three to four days, you, it, it's hard to, to pick up the pieces that, that has been destructed. So at the moment we are in state of uh, emergency. There's a curfew from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. because there's a lot of uh, um, damage building and the police are also doing their rounds. Uh, and the network is also uh, checking on women and making sure that women and girls and women with disability are safe. The first priority is them safe. And then when they are safe, then they can look at other extended people around them and also looking at uh, water, which is one of the main priority issue at the moment is water, because a lot of the water source have been damaged from the outskirt of Port Villa. Port Villa itself has a, a good running water system, but then the communities that we work with uh, outskirt of Port Villa and in Safia, other provinces, they don't have that same running water like Port Villa has. So um, water tanks and well uh, uh, have been damaged pretty, pretty badly. So I think the first, the first response the government will be looking at is making sure the, there's running water for Port Villa City so then we can respond to the affected side. And uh, there's, it, it's been a dramatized event because you are still picking up for, from Chuti trying to recover and then tropical cyclone Kevin hits you again. And hmm. it's a long nine hours of standing inside your house, making sure that the door is not ripped open from you, making sure that your rooftop is kept intact. And if you are a mom with so many kids, your worry would be kids first and then the house, making sure that you're protected. Um, that's a journey I think for this week, a lot of us won't, we, we will, it will linger on our mind because we've never been hit like this. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty harsh. Uh, now at the office, there's no power, but I'm, I'm happy uh, because we are very trained on emergency response and we have been doing so since 2015. We have to be prepared. And so uh, the team usually had emergency baskets that we do have. And in, inside those baskets, we do have um, power banks that can keep us and then we got sol small solar chargers where you can charge it when there's sun so um but the internet there it's it's up and down so it keeps I, I either you have small and then automatically it goes and then it comes back again um we we also uh, have the network of women uh weather and weather which we do the um early warning preparedness before Chudi came, before uh, Vanuatu, actually from the Vanuatu Meteorological Department, uh, warned the Vanuatu citizens about the cyclones that will come, uh, Woman with Weather has put out a message earlier on Monday. 
Monday last week. Now it's Monday this week, so it's a week. So Monday last week, early in the morning, we did the first, just preparing women and even the whole community, the whole citizen in Vanuatu, preparing them that, you know, we are still in cyclone season, so don't lose focus, make sure you prep because this weather is not going any better. You have to prepare your house for cyclone, your food, your water, and th the other protection issues that women would be thinking of when there's a cyclone. And later in the afternoon, the Vanuatu Meteo Geo has a department started to put out messages of a tropical low, which gradually within the next three hours, it form into a um, tropical cyclone. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Flora. I know that, so you've touched on the network there, but maybe, I mean, I think that's obviously a great example of a women led solution. So I wonder if you might be able to provide some background there on how that came about and, and, and a little bit further on what it is in terms of getting information out to uh, women who may not otherwise have access to that information. Okay, I'm not sure if uh, Flora can hear me at the moment, but, um, oh, sorry, it might yeah, be on sorry, delay. Yeah. yeah, sorry, Angela, I, I couldn't hear the last one. I think my internet just gone off a little bit. Can you repeat? Yes, of course. I was uh, wondering if you could share some more background on the network that you've created there, because I think it's, uh, from my understanding, it's a really uh, perfect example of women leading on this type of innovation to make sure that the... Um, that the information is getting to where it needs to go. So just to share what the network is. Um, thank you, Anjana. Uh, so the network we have here is Women in Talk Talk Together Network, which is consists of 5,000 women directly we work with in five islands in four provinces. So each province have its own um, uh, women leaders that connected to the hub, which is me. So within Women in Talk Talk Together, we had a disability arm of the network, which is um, Women in Talk Talk Together Sunshine. It's all uh, women with disability, uh, different impairments. And then we do have uh, Women Wet and Weather, and this is the information uh, system, the sharing of information through this network. And we, we have given uh, women leaders, around 50 women leaders, um, handset like this. A smart handset, which they can take photos and then they can report immediately on what is happening on the ground. And it's really good when there's uh, the service, like if there's reception, uh, you can really work with that. But if our main uh, internet uh, or uh, communication uh, companies are down, then you can't reach them unless you reach them only from satellite phones, uh, which we we are yet to have. We don't we don't own one satellite phones yet, so uh, we were hoping we might probably need to have one when you know dealing with such event like this. Uh, we are saving life really. So women talk talk together. The objective is to make sure that women can actually have voices in places where decision making are being um, uh, talked about or being activated. So uh, this time in an emergency, women will be sitting inside the, uh, the com in the community structure. We have the, uh, there's a CDCC there, which is a community disaster climate change committees. And in that committee, our women can be sitting in that, in that area. And we also sit in the provincial uh, emergency operations center which is where the government, the directors and managers are there. So they make decisions, we also input. And um, mainly we are looking at the protections of women. So uh, food security, um, livelihood security, um, their health security, their health, um, their health and anything that actually evolves the life of a women. We make sure that we, that, that the voices and they are included. So at the moment we will be doing assessment. So the women are also already on the ground. They already know uh, how many disability, how many uh, women with uh, single mothers, how many widows that are there. 
uh, our system is so patriarchy that you mm. you couldn't uh, talk about women. It's only male-headed household. So when it comes to emergency, what women in Tok Tok together have done is making sure that we are there. Women are on the table. We actually trying to make sure get the voices in and anything that comes in from the government or comes in from other partners reach everybody even those that are not even in in community we will call them like they are neglected in the community but this network captured all women women that went to school women that don't go to school women that know how to write women that don't know how to write so a lot of the members are illiterate so they really depend on someone that can actually give them information and when you look at that uh their life depend on you and uh, they have rich information they are indigenously survey like they are very rich in how they can become more resilient in their own way but they need that information to pass through them also to know where they're heading uh women who talk talk together have created that space and have linked them with other sisters uh, around the the region as well uh, sisters from the solomon from samoa from from australia even we we got um exchange from uh, other partners from across the uh, asia uh, countries as well just for them to uh, get to uh, know how they can also uh, able to uh, be resilient in what they do we had a very good tool uh, that uh, ActionAid uses uh, around the globe is the woman-led community-based uh, protection tool. And it's a framework that it allows women to identify uh, the issues mm -hmm. and then had solutions for it as well. And we got around 400 women trained on that. And they are also the 400 women that are trained to do their response in their own communities. But mm -hmm. now my only thing is getting hold of them when the the net the um, um, communication telecommunications are back on, and yep. get them to tell us the figures so we can respond effectively to the affected um, communities. Yeah. Okay, well, Flora, thank you so much for that update. And I know that um, I think plenty of people have some questions or comments, and please do uh, put them in the chat there. Um, and I know, um, I mean, just uh, for those who don't know, and open if, if someone might correct me if I have got something wrong here, but I mean, mentioning the patriarchal system there, I just think it's incredible what, uh, what's been done amongst women to create sort of solutions around that absolutely male dominated parliament that is in uh, Vanuatu. Um, just looking at the 2020 elections, it was the third consecutive all male parliament that was voted in. And um, only 6% of the candidates who were able to contest there were actually uh, were, were women. So this is the, the patriarchal uh, structures that you're talking about, Flora. And just to think how uh, yeah. it's, I, I love that hearing the solutions are just saying, well, okay, we've got to come up with solutions outside of this because you're not giving us a voice in that room there. So we will work around that and within this to make sure that we can get the uh, help that's needed. So please do uh, ask um, any further questions there. But so a different, a, a bit of a, a, a shift in the conversation now, but um, I do want to bring you into the conversation, uh, Tiani. And I'd, I'd love for you to uh, give a bit of a, a background to uh, the audience here to share more on the work that you're doing uh, using Indigenous knowledge to address climate change. And I'm really interested in zero methane uh, aquaculture as well. So just to open up there. Yeah, no worries. So Kapu Migi Batanga, everybody. That's uh, good morning from my ancestral language, beautiful Kareg, right up in the top of the Torres Straits paying respects to the Paramount people, the owners of the Adelaide Hills region that I'm calling in from today, and paying respects to all other First Nations people on the call and the lands of which everyone's calling in from as well. So I'm really lucky in my work. I have my dream job. I have the incredible opportunity to work with climate change solutions and to work with First Nations communities to uplift uh, wisdom and knowledges and cultural background and understanding into the sphere of climate change and climate ad adaptation to mitigate the risk of um, climate change that we have at the moment. So I guess there's a few different parts of this and I'll just start with my, my main full-time thing is that 
is with the aquaculture industry. I'm lucky enough to work with CH4 Global and we have a grand mission to mitigate methane at massive scale. And we work with aquaculture technologies with asparagopsis, which is a red seaweed or um, properly called a macroalgae that has this amazing ability to reduce methane output in livestock ruminants. So that's cattle and sheep, goats, um, anything with four stomachs. So really incredible technology, really amazing plant and really amazing, I guess, like plant wisdom as well in that. It's a, a natural product and we work with the aquaculture and scale up of the plant and also then the integration of that into feed formulation to reduce methane. So there is a lot of damage from the agriculture industry in terms of how much methane is put out. About a sixth of the world's uh, methane comes from agriculture. So it's a really important part of climate mitigation and, and climate change solutions that we need to work with. Methane is also 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide. So it hangs around in the atmosphere uh, for less long, but is really, really potent, especially as our world starts to warm and warm. So it's really cool to be able to be in this space, working with asparagopsis and working with communities. Ways that we do that at CH4, I'm the lead community engagement officer there. So a lot of my work is working in with First Nations communities about how we can work together, how we can make sure that everybody comes along the journey. So we have a big focus on supporting regional and remote communities to ensure that they're a part of the journey. We know that in the climate space that often it's the people who are contributing the least, uh, who are being affected the most by climate, and that's all through Pacific Islands and nations, as we've just heard, um, which, which is really devastating. So when we're looking at climate solutions and we're looking at opportunities for, I guess, economic viability uh, and creating industries, we need to make sure that these people are on on board and being included and that their voices are heard and that they're not being left behind in these conversations that they're actually leading the way with that. So with CH4, we've got great relationships with First Nations communities across Australia. At the moment, we've got a strategic partnership um, called Moya Bangara, which is seaweed country being built with Narung Nations. They're the owners of the York Peninsula and we work with them in lots of different ways, which might be providing opportunities to do two-way learning, adding in their cultural knowledge and understanding with our business, uh, understanding that our staff have fantastic uh, understanding of cultural competency with Naranga and that we're going by the right cultural law here on their country that we operate on. And then for us to be able to uplift skill sharing with the knowledge that we have about seaweed agriculture, agriculture and the industry with Naranga nations to bring them on board. So we also have great relationships with Ghana, who are the traditional owners of the Adelaide area. Um, and we include their arts and knowledges into what we're doing as well. So it's really two way um, uplifting and bringing that together, because I think often now people talk about First Nations knowledges or traditional knowledges and they try and separate it from Western science as if it's different. Traditional knowledges are just the original sciences. So through trial and error and through you know, understanding the land and understanding nature and ecology by living on it and being really ingrained in the environment. That's some of the first sciences that we know. And here in so-called Australia, that science is over 60,000 years old. So really, really cool. I'm also lucky enough to be able to do lots of work with communities on the ground where we look at traditional knowledges of caring for country and the way that First Nations people work in harmony with the land through burns, through regeneration of plants and that's been my upbringing um, from living in lots of different remote Aboriginal communities as a First Nations person as well but I've been lucky enough to work with that to uplift these voices of First Nations people to share their knowledge with wider Australia so that we can care for country properly. Um, Australia is a country that requires fire to regenerate and to look after the land properly and obviously when we don't do things like regular burns there's a lot of um, highly flammable plant material around and we have huge outbreaks of bushfires, especially in the changing climate that we have with lots of different amounts of uh, atmospheric chemicals in the air and a lot of different changing, you know, temperatures and those sorts of things. So really important to be working with the land and with the people who understand the land the best. 
And so a lot of my work is about uplifting marginalised voices to be able to share what that is so we can learn that better. So hopefully that covers your question enough. Um, and it certainly yeah, does. I think everybody's awesome. been getting a fast lesson in what this technology is about as well. I mean, I don't know if other people are feeling similar to me, but I just, um, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm learning a lot there and I've obviously had a look on the website and it's fascinating and interesting. And um, I also feel it's, a, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of optimism there as well in terms of those solutions, which is really nice to hear. Yeah. Can you share with us now also, I mean, what motivates your work and your broader climate activism. So what was what's behind you wanting to get involved in this? I think growing up on country in community, like I, I attended a mission school in my primary school in Palm Island, which is just off Queensland. And that was a really beautiful place to grow up. And if, um, if anyone knows about the history of Palm Island in the early 2000s, had a pretty rough history where the government um, displaced uh, Aboriginal people for committing small crimes. I hope you can see my fingers there because obviously that's not always necessarily why they were displaced and moved off of country. So it was a group of a lot of different First Nations people with different law, different language coming together in one place and then being put under severe um, government law to uh, go with Western way. So that was a lot of uh, where I spent a fair chunk of my growing up and it was a beautiful place to grow up. We were surrounded by the natural environment uh, camping, fishing, hunting, spending time really embedded in nature and growing up with community, it's ingrained in, you know, First Nations people who look after the land that when we go out and we're just going for a walk that, you know, plants are being regenerated, seed pods are being cracked open, the water's being looked at for the health of country, different um, seaweeds and plants are being looked at, observational science really all the way every day. And that was, you know, what I learned from the age of five. So I think trying to understand nature in that way and then moving to different Aboriginal communities, always in natural environments and really caring about the land, knowing that we're not separate from country. We are country expressed in, you know, a human form. So there's no difference between the land and the water and the sky than there is you and I or any other plants and animals and knowing that we're not above the environment. Um, our place in the environment as a part of country is just to, fulfill our niche or our role of looking after it. All animals and plants have, you know, some sort of ecological ability to look after and care for country and we're exactly the same. So then having that way of, you know, being knowing and doing ingrained in me was a big part of my motivation. And then when I was 16, I went for a, a dive off of um, Lutruweta, uh, which is Tasmania. And I was lucky enough to see the Derwent Sea Star and then in my early 20s, uh, the Derwent Sea Star became Australia's first marine animal extinction. And having an, a marine animal extinction at the age of, I think I was 22 or 23, was wild. Um, you know, a few years before I'd seen it in relative abundance and then seeing an extinction and realising that we're an ex an, in an extinction crisis as well. That, you know, if I have children, that their world that they see and the, the wildlife and the nature that they get to experience will be completely different to what I grew up with and the people bef before us as well. Um, obviously, we're in an evolving and adapting world, but the scale at which we're losing species, at which we're harming the earth and that, you know, we're in the Anthropocene, humans are pushing the environment to evolve and change at a rate that's unprecedented to the way that it can evolve and look after itself. So I think really trying to hold on to preserving nature because of my cultural background and what I've been instilled the knowledge is from my mum and family and community and elders is what sort of drives me in this space. We've only got one life. And so I think the best thing we can do with it is try and preserve it for the generations to come. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for that, Tiani. And again, I, I'm sure people have uh, loads of questions as well and have learnt a lot in the last five minutes too. Uh, Blair, uh, to bring you in now, um, and again, I mean, a very different uh, approach now, but um, I know that you are a well-known climate activist. You've been in this space for a long time. Can we talk about what you're doing in philanthropy, what you're looking to do in terms of driving climate action through uh, Ethinvest? Sure. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for organizing this. And I've learned a lot already this morning and this afternoon. Um, just also really impressed all the time with the importance of women in the movement and how much of that good work is being done around the world in all kinds of uh, levels of capacity, whether you're an NGO or you're on the ground doing aid work or you're 
um, working in, in my case, um, investment side, impact and ethical investing, but um, in particular around um, the charitable giving side. So a lot of our clients um, at Ethan Best Give uh, through what we call the Community Impact Foundation. We make it really easy for them to do that. And the vast majority is in climate environment. Um, we have our own foundation, we do the same. But I think the real ethos and difference of working at a place like Ethan Best after years of activism and, and working in the NGO space um, is the, the giving back of uh, 40 years in the, in the charitable sector to try and support smaller charities um, in the climate and environment space. So I'm given the flexibility and freedom to support a lot of organizations that probably wouldn't exist without um, some help and support from uh, people in the community. You know, it's quite hard to set up as a new charity or a new organization. I started 350.org um, with no idea of what to do or how to do it, um, but learned the hard way. So now I might as well use some of that knowledge to support um, some of the smaller charities and groups around uh, Australia in particular. Um, so we do a lot of that at FNVest and, and I do that on the back of um, two wonderful, my boss, Trevor Thomas and our founder, Ross Knowles, who are really active in the charity space for uh, 31 years. So I, I guess that's the um, Ethinvest advantage. And the other thing I'd mentioned in addition is having started the divestment campaign here in Australia with 350 and the team um, there, the next big question was, okay, well, I've taken my money out of the bad stuff, fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, then where do I put it? And I feel like I really have the benefit now of working with a lot of people who are trying to answer that question. Where can you put it? What do you do to have a po really positive impact? Um, and some of that's interestingly blurring from uh, the philanthropy side of giving and the investment side. What I'm seeing around the world, and I, I say this with my climate and capital media hat on, is the need for kind of blended solution thinking um, around the, the three working together, investment, philanthropy, and NGOs, to look at what solutions we need, how we get capital into them, how we help small innovative companies like Seaweed is a perfect example. Um, we don't want just one, we want hundreds of these new solution outfits um, getting up and going. But it's a really hard thing for them once they've come up with a, a solution to then find their way into the investment space. Um, so Australian Impact Investment, who we work with closely, um, one of our sort of offshoot organizations does kind of wholesale or large scale investment in the space impact investment. And we have the benefit of the research and knowledge that they do about what really is good um, and, and cutting through. At the moment, it's not really well regulated. So it's really hard to find information uh, or find consistent information about what a good impact investment is. Um, so I, I'm really enjoying learning a lot in that space about how not only you know, someone for the general public would think about it, but how larger investment funds, um, super funds, for instance, begin to think differently about um, not sticking with what's safe, but figuring out how to benefit from investing in real impact uh, because now there are a lot more options. Um, so that's kind of how I landed at, at Ethinvest instead of carrying on with um, working with it in the NGO sector. I think there's a lot of crossover and it's really important that we start talking together across uh, the money side, the NGO side and the investment and, and sort of impact side to um, really drive change. We don't have a lot of time. Really many people say we have three years to turn the corner. That's gonna involve moving a lot of money very fast in, an, in a very conservative sector that doesn't often understand or wanna take the risk of jumping into the solution to climate space. Um, so I think it's an interesting time, really interesting time. And I think women will play a really critical role in that kind of cross crossover between the various um, three or four things. Mm, um, I think we've seen so many examples of women in terms of collaboration uh, making a really huge impact. And so, I mean, I, I think and I hope that that would speak to that crossover occurring there as well. Um, are you yeah. seeing, a, have you seen a shift in the last couple of years in terms of appetite for interest for being involved in this space? Absolutely incredible. I mean, if you look at the, the US passage of the um, Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, really it was a climate bill and it it's, I've heard the figures of $880 billion US suddenly overnight almost transferred into the kind of low carbon decarbonization sector. Um, and it really showed and said to the whole global market and the US market in particular, uh, that's it, we're done with uh, fossil fuels as, as the kind of core driver of the economy. We're now going to leg up into um, these solutions and it's going to be where our jobs sit, where our innovation sits and where our economy sits. 
And for women, the opportunity in that is incredible. And I'd, I'd say this is the thing that probably excites me the most is um, decarbonizing the globe makes great economic sense as well as it makes great climate and environment sense. But to do that, it usually revol involves solutions uh, not only developing them and, and running them and funding them, um, but, but dr being driven by locally based um, outfits like seaweed or like um, renewable energies on the ground or a smart management of energy system or, you know, green hydrogen still the great unknown, potentially great for heavy industry. Um, that gives us the opportunity to change the kind of top down fossil fuel white male structure economically that we've seen it, you know, since the industrialized times of, of, of the world, um, we have the chance to change that and make it a much more open, localized and accessible economy for all kinds of people, particularly women. Women are really well placed to run businesses in this space. Um, we'll need to do a lot of work to demand that that stays a possibility for them. There's no doubt that the big end of of fossil fuels will be looking at ways to control the next energy market of the world. So it's really the onus is on us to push that out and say, we don't want that model. We want a model that is more inclusive, uh, more localized and, and being run on the ground locally in countries around the world. Rare earth minerals is a great example of this. Um, Australia has, right now we provide about 50% of the rare earth minerals for things like batteries. Um, we're in a country with a great sort of regulated structure that means workers are generally treated better. Um, we can set an example about how other countries, whether they're in Africa or elsewhere, um, should you know, shift from a mining uh, mindset that is just trash the planet, ignore traditional owners, landowners, uh, make as much money as you can and move on to a different approach, uh, including a, a, a circular economy approach that includes recycling. Again, another thing that if we do it well, we'll be close to where it's, the production is happening and the mining is happening, which means keeping jobs close rather than just exporting to other countries like China um, and then dumping those environmental problems on, on other countries in the world. So I think there's a huge opportunity here if we take it. Um, and we're really standing at the crossroads of whether we as a world decide uh, enough for that, you know, tiny group of people who maintain ownership over resources and we think differently about what this means. Um, so it's a great opportunity, but a lot of work to do. Mm. Um, you mentioned some of the, um, I think, uh, I love what you say about the localized solutions as well, that it's not kind of one solution that will go to the globe. It's sort of, it does depend on these local solutions. And um, it, uh, I saw a stat last week about the proportion of women involved in climate tech entrepreneurship, and it is significantly higher than uh, a general entrepreneurship. Um, I'm not sure about the investment figures. I'm going to guess that they are still way too low. We know that in uh, general entrepreneurship, uh, all female founded businesses, only about th only 3% of uh, private investment went to those businesses last year. Uh, mm. So there is so much work to do ensuring that uh, um, female founders are getting the investment that they need. But also there is some positives and some green shoots, I feel, in the climate tech space where for whatever reason, women are really getting involved in huge numbers. So um, let's make sure that they're getting heard and having a voice and that they're getting the investment as well. Exactly. As so uh, I want to go to some questions and I can see Julie has, uh, hi Julie. Uh, so Julie's uh, already uh, raised a couple of points here. Um, Blair, it might come to, oh, might, these questions might go to you first of all. So uh, sure. please start sharing other questions also, but this is where the, um, the previously uh, shared question happens to be. Uh, so I uh, should love to, Julie says that she'd love to hear your insights on gender lens investing as part of ethical investing and impact investing. Mm, absolutely. Good question, Julie. Um, and a couple of my teammates are on the call. I'd say the, the kind of easy, easier way to do this is just do a really good screening lens. And if you include all things ESG, you know, environment, social and governance. Um, you can't not look at, at the gender mix. Um, and this is becoming more, you're able to do this more and more because people are reporting, particularly those who are doing it well. So choosing those you know, outfits that are running funds, for instance, or um, investing in impact, 
um, you kind of almost automatically have a, a bit of a screen lens that's leaning in the direction of, of more diversity, which is fantastic. What you find is the bigger giant mainstream is really slow to catch up on um, using an ESG lens that will report openly on, on everything from women, but also other kinds of diversity. Um, so, you know, it gets easier and easier to find the better options. And we need to demand that that reporting happen more consistently and that it be real and credible. So um, some of the real need for regulation in the climate tech, for instance, space is, is it legitimate? Is it additional? Who's running it? You know, is it the same old fossil fuel company is trying to look green or are there you know new people popping into the space with very different approaches including you know just bringing younger people in shifts the the kind of dynamic of the of the kind of the company um, uh, they don't have the kind of overlay of old stuff if you will the old thinking in terms of um, everything has to be top down everything has to be um, owned by people with 60 years experience equals you know cutting out women and more diversity um, those that are open to kind of trying different things. And again, the, the climate solution space really lends itself to that. Um, my good friend, Danny Kennedy, who runs an uh, amazing thing called New Energy Nexus, and um, he's on the board of CalSeed, talks all the time about disruptors. If you want to know where the money is going to go and who's going to have the biggest impact, watch the disruptors. He says it all the time. Women are kind of natural disruptors. So this lends itself well to helping them find ways into the market. Um, and, and just you know, looking at industries like Tahani's um, seaweed business, these are businesses that can be run you know, in the space where the seaweed is. So that doesn't mean you have to be in Sydney or Melbourne. In fact, that's really not good for your business if you're in seaweed, because um, you're in a big crowded city with a, a huge you know, harbor of, that's too busy to, to do this kind of growing. So it lends itself to women being involved in starting businesses in smaller places uh, where they want to be, where they want to raise families. So you know, I think the opportunity is there. Now we have to kind of pack the structure in behind it to allow people to know what's good, who are the innovators, um, who's got runs on the board, and then you know help support them as they kind of make their way into the bigger economy globally. Mm. Okay, thank you, Blair. Um, Tiani, I'm wondering if you might be able to follow on from uh, that. We talked about um, entrepreneurs there. I wondered if you might be able to uh, talk to uh, women in STEM, also First Nations people's participation in STEM as well. And I, when we look at all these jobs that will come up in the green economy and through the green transition, and we do have, um, you know, women are severely underrepresented in STEM. Um, I've also looked at figures that look at how, um, you know, construction will be a huge sector for renewable energy into the future, but women are hugely underrepresented there. We're something like 12% or so of that sector. Uh, can, can you share your view on, on that issue and what's happening and are we running into, are you optimistic or are we looking set to have problems in being able to achieve the green, green transition that we want? Yeah, for sure. Definitely massive underrepresentation in STEM. Um, I'm lucky enough to be a part of Science and Technologies Australia's um, Superstars of STEM, which is a program for um, female and non-binary people in their fields to be able to uplift their voices to get some science communication and media training to help sort of build the, the network of females in the STEM community and uplift their voices. And they found at a big uh, science awards night a few years ago, one of the speakers said, um, put your hand up if you can name five amazing science technologists, engineers or mathematicians um, from Australia and everyone in the room put their hand up. And then uh, she said, and keep your hand up if you can name five female STEM professionals and one person out of hundreds of people kept their hand up. And it was sort of that fantastic reflection of the way that um, not necessarily that there aren't STEM professionals who are female, but that the way that the media portrays our voices or the sort of um, comm skills that we're able to lap into or the events that we get invited to or the capacity that we have as you know females who are the caretakers of our families of our old people who have so many hats that we wear as um, as women that we are in a really unique position and that there therefore is a big gap also I guess yeah the, the constructs of society that prevent us from being able to have the same opportunities to be in these ed education spaces. So I think there's a lot of 
push from universities and schools now um, to get STEM professionals who are female to go into schools and have conversations with young people. I think when I was growing up, I pictured science, scientists as, you know, white lab coats inside with Petri dishes and, um, you know, the lab based technicians and then realizing that science is basically understanding anything, um, having a curiosity for a process or for a system is having an interest in science and then realizing that it's not some sort of binary form of what a scientist looks like that you can um, dress however you want and keep your personality and style and be a scientist and that it's just studying and understanding what you're interested in. So I think there's definitely a push from universities to change that. There's definitely pushes for funding and adaptation. I think industry is realizing the extreme power of females in this space. It's uh, women who will lead the climate crisis towards a more you know, harmonious future. We see that when women are in leadership, that we're more often, uh, sorry, that governments are more likely to sign international treaties for peace and for climate justice. Mm -hmm. So we're really, really powerful in this space and our voices are definitely needed and heard. And I think for young people and young women to be able to see more females in the space and be able to step into that role and feel that confidence rather than even, you know, in high school, I was in a, a regional area. There were 17 of us in grade 12. And I think there was one or two uh, of us in chemistry, three of us in biology. I think there were two people in math. Um, yeah. And so it was just a difference of subject selection as well. And having that sort of career guidance and counselling that didn't necessarily push us towards STEM, that pushed us more towards other types of careers and not being able to sort of step into that and feel like it was a space that was built for women. So I hope that that's changing and developing. And I think that as a young person or as anyone within this industry, it's really important to have our voices heard and to uplift other people, especially within our First Nations communities, um, being able to um, empower our young people to know that, you know, your auntie and uncle might not necessarily have a piece of paper that calls them a scientist or an engineer, but they're building their community with the basis and the backing of science and engineering. So they might not have that Western um, certificate that proves that they have knowledge in that area, but at the end of the day, that is still the basis of, of their minds and their mindset and what they're doing. And mm. I recently heard from someone, they said to me, oh, you can't be what you can't see. And I challenged them on that. And I said, I don't know, because if that was the case, no one would have been anything, um, <laughs> however you want to call be. Um, but it's definitely easier to step, step into that space when you walk into a room and you go oh look there's someone like me there's another first nations person there's um broad scale variety from different communities i fit in and i belong here with other people so i think it's definitely a space that's changing but it's our job as women in this area now to continue to uplift and do the work to get more people involved and to be able to change the future scope because it's you know our women in our communities working on these solutions with regeneration with circular economies with recycling that are really making big impacts and it's supported by the men who support us to do that too. Mm, mm. Um, such great points thank you so much and um, I, I mean it's something I recently just heard from Michaela Jade on this subject in terms of uh, STEM in schools and she made the point that in uh, and maybe this was uh, similar to your experience Tiani given you mentioned you know three in chemistry or, or whatever it was that she said that they just don't have the the STEM teachers and sometimes these are schools that are like literally within the same communities as the big new green energy uh, uh, infrastructure project that's sort of you know slated for the next few years and there these schools are next to these massive uh, projects that uh, the students in the schools are not seeing the opportunities within them. So there's just mm. so much scope to make sure that it's, I mean, it's not just about getting to girls in schools and certainly not just about getting to metropolitan schools, that it has to be all across Australia. Yeah, 100%. And I think, you know, I found a program recently where the Australian government's put in some money in towards um, industry-based uh, postgraduate education so that people are able to so say study a PhD or their master's and work in industry and receive an income at the same time and having a chat with some you know I've, I've got a group of friends where a, a bunch of different STEM professionals and we catch up and give each other feedback about what we're doing and try and you know have it have a nice safe space to be able to talk about the industry and what's going on and we were talking about the sacrifice as a woman of 
you know, if you're following a career or you're trying to read a solution and then and family planning and relationship building and all of these, you know, different juxtapositions that go on pause when you pick one or the other that we have to pick um, as, a, as a female that is very different to that. And I think these sorts of programs that allow people to study, push for further education, to uplift their skill set, to be able to continue working, to have more flexible arrangements around family planning, more accessible childcare, better understanding of, you know, people who have children and families who are studying and have that flexibility is what we need to do to be able to uplift our women so they don't have to pick one or the other or pause their career or not be able to lean into solutions or, you know, you're a career woman or you're a family person and have that more holistic way of being so that we're able to empower ourselves and feel connected to our families, connected to country and our culture and continue to push ourselves you know, in the brain capacity of uplifting these different circular circular economy solutions and being able to have access to education systems that empower us and our future generations as well. Mm, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so I do want to come full circle back to Flora before handing over to Michelle, who will close up the session. Uh, Flora, um, and, and Blair has actually put a nice question regarding where I wanted to go. Anyway, my first uh, so this will be a two-part question. My first one was, what do you need right now, given the current crisis? And then the second part of this, which is from Blair, which is what can we be doing in Australia to best support Pacific Island nations who are dealing with the huge impacts of climate change? I think just on mute. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. I think the two questions are very important right now. Um, right now, yes, as um, Blair has put there, donations would be really good. Uh, we got a lot of things that are ruined in terms of uh, house, household kit, kitchen kits, um, cotton kits for women. Uh, yeah, for what the network will be doing is we will be uh, giving them, uh, really looking at the protection um, issues. So dignity back, like, uh, a stay free soap, things that are hygiene specifically meant for women. Those are the things that uh, we couldn't um, uh, capture or get enough of when there's a lot of heavy impact uh, because we've got a, lot, a little supplier in Vanuatu. Mm -hmm. But if we can have some of that pack to come, that would be that would be really good. Um, the second one to your your question would be helping, I think I'll go to the first one, still the first one, satellite phones would be really good if um, Australia can help us get some, uh, because it's it's an issue when you couldn't um, get hold of the uh, women and girls, and they might be suffering, but you don't know how to even get to them, uh, or even reach them, for example. I think the good thing is when we had, what we are doing on the normal one is getting them prepared, um, that will be the, another one that is, is really highly required. And yes, of course, if for donation, it will, uh, we, uh, Austra ActionAid Australia has an account that we can get the money through and then they can uh, directly um, give to uh, ActionAid Vanuatu to, um, go to do the response. Mm -hmm. but your second question is, I think a good thing for Australia to look into it for you know why or what we have been facing as pacific countries is looking to fossil fossil fuel face out but not face down because if it's face down it, it means we are still um continually encouraging um destructions of uh, environment and even more, still the emissions are still going. And we will be keep on impacted like this until uh, there'll be no more, no more island nation left. I mean, we will be underwater. So I think reducing that fossil, just fossil phase out would be the good way forward. And if that Australia can lead on that, that would be something that it will save um, communities, it will save countries. We won't need to find another solution of a, another country to move to because our heritage and our cultural um, 
and our ethnic groups, our identity is with the Pacific, with the Pacific Ocean. I think that that if they can be the front frontier of all our Pacific Island to move that forward. I know we've got a lot of other smaller other uh, stakeholders across other countries, but if we can have them uh, putting them in front of or the other one, I would say they're the big brother, or they're the bigger sister in, in, in the ocean. They can do the first step and others will follow. Mm -hmm. Others probably are still just waiting to see who will, who will put the first step. So uh, I'm vouching for that. And I know Australia is behind the campaign on loss and damage as well. So I am um, pretty sure that, you know, if that can us be keep on reminded to the other, uh, countries when they are in relevant spaces to just keep on letting them know that, you know, loss and damage is real and it's not something that to take it lightly because when we lose something, we can't retrieve it back. It's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Thank you, Flora. Uh, phase out as opposed to phase down. Unfortunately, I think that was the two words that were the sticking point from COP26, weren't they? So, um, yeah. so much uh, to be done there. Thank you, Flora. Yeah. And Michelle, I'll be handing over to you. I know that, and I'm sure that you'll answer this, but I know that uh, there has been some questions just asking about how uh, we can donate to ActionAid to Vanuatu specifically. So just to make sure if you can clarify that as well. So thank you, everybody. And thank you to our excellent speakers who just provided three very different perspectives on um, innovation and I feel like inspiration there as well, but also very real in terms of what we are confronting right now. So thank you, everybody. Thanks so much, Angela, for moderating. And look, I, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to our incredibly inspiring um, speakers. Um, I feel like we could have listened to you all afternoon. Um, this is a, really just a bite-sized opportunity to, to hear about some of the great efforts that are happening um, you know, in Australia and overseas. So a big thank you, Blair, Tiani and Flora. Um, and, and I also wanted to thank everyone for joining today. Um, for our Women Leading Climate Solutions series. This is the first one. And, you know, and we hope you'll continue to stay with us. As Blair highlights, we've got three years to, to really turn the corner. And so highlighting and spotlighting and amplifying and scaling up some of these amazing efforts that women are leading on the ground um, is essential. Um, so in terms of donations to um, Vanuatu, um, I think that my colleague is about to put up a link to... Um, that you can follow. This is a link to the Arise Fund, but we will make sure any donation that comes through this is targeted to Vanuatu. Um, the, the Arise Fund, uh, which I mentioned at the start, that Angela is part of the Arise Leadership Circle, it aims to support women on the front lines of the climate crisis, and that is both getting resources in the immediate aftermath of the disaster, as well as preparing for uh, you know, climate related disasters. So um, if you follow that link, you'll find out a little bit more information, but um, you'll see on there, um, there's a link for something like $55. We can get those kind of dignity kits to women in Vanuatu that make sure they do have dignity in a crisis, access to, to basic things like underwear and sanitary supplies and those critical things. Um, and, you know, so 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 do follow that and um, and we will make sure that any funding is directed to support Vanuatu. I mean, definitely through the Arise Fund, we've been able to train 30,000 women um, in 19 countries um, to be able to prepare and respond to the climate crisis. And we know, and even from, um, you know, Flora's uh, own work, that when women are given opportunities to lead, more lives are saved. Uh, women and girls are better protected from violence and uh, women's position in society is also transformed. So do have a look at that link um, if you'd like to support. But thank you again for joining us and thanks to our amazing panel. Hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.